Uh, my name is Mike Mann. I'm going to introduce our panelists here and uh, give you a short intro, and then we're going to get into the meat of it. So first on the left here, we have uh, Chris Harani. He's a partner and shareholder at the IP firm of McAndrews Held in Malloy. He's a leading authority in the field of design law, counseling clients on a wide range of strategic, strategic design protection and enforcement issues. Chris currently chairs the ABA's Design Rights Committee and is the past chair of the AIPLA Committee on Industrial Designs. An Egyptian goddess, he authored amicus briefs on behalf of the AIPLA in both the petition stage and the en banc stage. He has his JD from the University of Chicago and holds a BS in engineering from Marquette University. Then we have Sarah Bernstein, just to his right. She's an associate professor of law at the University of Oklahoma. She has a BA in art and design from Iowa State University and a JD also from the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on design law, not surprisingly, with a particular emphasis on design patents. Then we have Perry Sudman. He is a recognized pioneer in design law. He was founder and chair of the Industrial Design Committee of the AIPLA and the Design Protection Committee of the Industrial Designer Society of America, ITSA. Among his many accomplishments, on behalf of Apple, he authored an amicus brief in the, the Egyptian goddess case, and it was the only amicus brief cited in the en banc petition. He has a master's degree in double E from UPenn and received his law degree from GW, where he's also uh, taught design law as an adjunct professor. He testified before Congress in the crash parts bill, which uh, Dennis mentioned earlier, and has authored many articles on design law, most recently, Design Patents Sunk in Interna International Seaway. <laughs> then we have Charles Morrow. He's president and founder of Morrow New Media, specializing in professional usability engineering, product design, and GUI design. Mr. Moore is currently chairman of the design protection section of ITSA and is ITSA's liaison to the USPTO for Design Day 2013. He has been an expert in over 75 major cases covering GUI designs, product design, and his work has included design patent, utility patent software, copyright, trade dress litigation. He holds a BS in industrial design from LA Art Center College of Design and a master's degree in ergonomics from NYU. He is also a certified human factors engineering professional. And my name is Michael Meehan. I have a PhD in computer science. Spent many years as a dot-comer and a computer science academic. Many of uh, those years were here. And I'm currently a patent attorney at Google. Was previously at Kenobi Martins in DC, and while clerking on the Federal Circuit, I had to read all their amicus briefs <laughs> and help Judge Bryson with his opinion on Egyptian goddess at the en banc stage. I also went to law school here, and I occasionally dabble in the, dabble in the academic arena, uh, publishing at the intersection of law and technology. So with that, you know our panel members, talk a little bit about what we're going to tell you today. So we're basically going to go over the legal framework of design patents. And we don't need much of an intro here. The last panel gave you most of it. But a lot of us look back as far as Gorham v. White, famous spoons. We look at the saddle cases, uh, Whitman saddle. We look at the microwave case, lit systems. But then it all really hits ground with Egyptian goddess. In addition to that, uh, we have a really interesting case on functionality in Richardson. And that's really the modern world of design patents that we're going to talk to you about today. Thankfully, we have Charles here as well, who's going to talk about the uh, cognitive science of shape perception that's been going on all this time and how it affects our what we're doing in law. And so that will help us look at, see what the future of design patent protection is going to be. So a few signposts for our talk today. So we're basically breaking it into two sections, no break in between, but two sections. Uh, first, Perry is going to talk to us about Egyptian goddess and infringement. Charles is going to give us a brief overview of some of the related perception research in this area. And then we're going to open up the majority of the first half for uh, panel and audience discussion, primarily based on some cases that we're going to put up. And you'll see those designs. Uh, then Chris is going to talk about Richardson and functionality. Again, Charles is going to talk about shape perception research related to that. And then we'll open it up again for panel discussion based on some cases. So without further ado, we have Perry. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Boy, the last time I was here, which was also the first time I was here, was 1988. 
when I attended <clears throat> the Stanford Conference on Design. And this was, I was the only lawyer there. This was a room about 10 times as big as this, full of industrial designers. I mean, people like Hartmut Esslinger and Bruce Burdick and David Kelly. And after that two days, I was really hooked. I was suddenly a design lawyer. I wasn't a patent attorney anymore. So we're going to talk about infringement. I'm going to lay the foundation of the law. Charles is going to get up and talk about new science. And then I'm going to come back and we'll have some specific examples of real life cases that we can talk about. Egyptian goddess is uh, the test, the, the case that controls design patent infringement. They made two significant holdings in that case. They threw out the point of novelty. It should no longer be used as the test for design patent infringement. The ordinary observer test is the sole test, they said, for determining whether a design patent has infringed. And was said earlier, the ordinary observer test is from the Gorham v. White 1871 Supreme Court case, which still lives, that says essentially if two designs are substantially the same in the eye of an ordinary observer, we have infringement. There's the uh, spoon and fork handles. I don't think design patents have ever been more broadly construed than this fundamental case. The patented design is in the middle. The two accused designs are on the left and right. And the Supreme Court in this case found that both of White's designs infringed the Gorham patent. Look at all those differences, tremendous. <laughs> So Egyptian goddess tweaked Gorham, and they tweaked it because they did away with the point of novelty test. And arguably, the point of novelty test was the only objective component of the design patent infringement test, which required a consideration of the prior art. But it had a lot of problems. So the Federal Circuit threw it out, and instead they said, the ordinary observer has to view the patented and accused design, quote, in the context of the prior art. But they didn't say exactly how you go about doing that. That's left for the lower courts to determine. But they did lay out what I have called guidelines. They didn't call them guidelines in the opinion, but I guess I culled about six or seven of these. And I just want to really quickly tell you what they are. Number one, when the claim design is close to the prior art, small differences can be important. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Guideline two, if the accused design has copied a particular feature of the claim design that departs conspicuously from the prior art, you're more likely than not have a case of infringement. Number three, if the claim design is a, has a combination of old features that nevertheless creates an appearance deceptively similar to the accused design, finding of infringement would be justified. Number four, and this is the big one, I want you to listen up. In some instances, the claimed and accused designs will be sufficiently distinct that it will be clear without more that the two designs do not look substantially the same. In other words, it will be clear without more that there's no infringement. Number five is kind of the flip side of that. If the two designs are not plainly dissimilar, not then you've got to look at the prior art. Number six, where there's many examples where you have a crowded prior art field, differences that might not be noticeable in the abstract can become significant to the ordinary observer. And lastly, you've got to look at the overall effect of these similarities and differences. So I distilled a lot of these seven guidelines into what I call the Sedman formulation. Actually, I didn't have that up there, but somebody suggested I should put it up there because this is not, this is not a, a court formulation. This is something that I've used for many years, actually, as a rule of thumb. And it seems to me that a lot of the Egyptian goddess guidelines can be summarized. Number one, if the claimed or accused design is closer visually to the prior art than to each other, more likely than not, you have no infringement. 
And conversely, if the claimed and accused designs are closer to each other visually than either is to the prior art, infringement is more likely. So with these seven guidelines, you will notice that the prior art is part of the formulation in six out of seven of them. And prior art is not considered in one of those guidelines, namely when the patented and accused designs are sufficiently distinct. So here has, here's what has happened in the courts since Egyptian goddess. The Minka lighting case was one of the first cases decided and a lot of courts glommed on to it. The court in Texas said, in some instances, the claimed and accused designs are sufficiently distinct, so you don't have to look at the prior art. There's no infringement. In other cases, they're not plainly dissimilar, so you should look at the prior art. So number one, don't look at the prior art. Number two, look at the prior art. And this is the way these seven guidelines have been distilled in the cases decided since Egyptian goddess. Here are some statistics. I know Dennis loves statistics, right Dennis? Now this doesn't include every single case decided. It includes the, the uh, opinions that we were able to read and see the designs. It doesn't include any Apple versus Mutum. Because <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk about them. We have 42 design patents that were considered post-Egyptian. In 15, 15 of those, there was no determination of infringement or non-infringement. 25 of those design patents were found not to be infringed. The number found infringed out of the 42 was two. Two. So the question is why? And I did some study, I did some analysis, and I have a, hyp a hypothesis of why. And that is, out of 42 of these design patents, the prior art was not considered in 27 of them. The court found that the patent and accused designs were sufficiently distinct. So the prior art disappeared in two-thirds of the cases decided since Egyptian goddess. And even the children are amazed, amazed by this. <laughs> Babies are amazed. So I want to give you my, my hypothesis of why this is. And the reason is because district court, and most of these cases were disposed of on summary judgment. District court judges are overloaded and overwhelmed, and they do not want to sit through a lengthy jury trial. It's the nature of the beast. They have a lot of work to do. So if you're a district court judge and you can find that, it, that the patented and accused designs are sufficiently distinct under some amorphous standard, which is probably like going home and say, honey, what do you think? <laughs> then you're not, you're not, you don't have to look at the prior art and you're gonna flush that case down the summary judgment toilet. That's my theory. On the other hand, if you find the prior art is relevant, you have to go through a lengthy, Difficult, more difficult analysis, and uh, your opinion is, is going to be that much um, harder to write, or you have to go to trial. So with that as the background, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> there we go. Here's Charles. Okay, thanks, Perry. There's a funny story with Perry. Last year uh, at the USPTO, I put on a session for the examiners uh, where we talked about uh, design patents and uh, how the industrial design profession sort of syncs up with uh, you know, uh, prosecution. And uh, I was done. We had like three presenters, and, we, uh, and I said, are there any questions? And uh, Perry raised his hand, and he said, uh, yeah, I have one question, but I, but I, I need to put my, my thumb drive into the, your computer in order to look at it. <laughs> And so Perry came 45 minutes later and we're still looking at these uh, cases. So what you just saw was world-class restraint on, on uh, Perry's part. Okay, so anyway, today I'm going to talk uh, briefly from the standpoint of a design professional. Uh, I worked for, for uh, many years in the field of industrial design. I still do. Uh, most of my work today actually is in uh, graphical user interface design. 
But I also have a graduate degree in ergonomics and the specialization that I was interested in and I've always been interested in is um, sort of the psychology of shape perception. One of the things that's happened um, in the general field of uh, cognitive science over the last 10 years or so is that there's been a very um, strong interest in shape perception it, as a, a fundamental aspect of um, how we navigate our world. And what I'm gonna do uh, today is just sort of take you very quickly through some uh, very high level insights, sort of more interesting research that's come up that is not embedded into uh, any of your legal practice uh, currently or legal tests, but this is, these are uh, science uh, concepts that are going to find their way into uh, this field of, uh, uh, of the law. So uh, this first uh, is uh, the first piece here. This is um, uh, a prior art uh, cluster diagram uh, from a case that I worked on. Any of you have worked in uh, the hand controller case, these video, video game controls. You know, it's a very uh, dense field of art. Uh, there's a relatively moderate congruity in this large field. And what we find when we look at the actual uh, cognitive science research literature on how we look at shape in these large fields, in fact, we do. Uh, give more attention, uh, as suggested in Egyptian Goddess and the other uh, tests, uh, we will give increasingly more detail to uh, these uh, larger fields of art. Now the interesting question uh, comes, um, so what happens if we eliminate the larger field of art? And for example, uh, as uh, Perry has described here in many of these cases currently, we bifurcate the uh, prior art and we essentially focus on only two controllers. Uh, which let's say in this case, this is just an example, not the actual case. Um, we uh, extract out all that prior art. So what happens actually cognitively, and this is I think is very interesting, the system in this, a uh, gentleman over here uh, this morning mentioned this about our ability to discriminate. And when we're actually tasked with the, with the uh, absolute comparison between two variables, the human information processing system sort of kicks into high gear in terms of its ability to differentiate between shapes. So what you could say the uh, existing literature suggests with respect to Egyptian goddess is that when you strike through that prior art literature, you may well be increasing the uh, level of detail that uh, a judge or the jury is, is going to be actually giving to the examination of uh, these objects. And uh, this happens not only in shape perception, but it happens in many other uh, of our senses, uh, sound, for example, uh, has a similar um, impact. So the point here and what, this, what the science is starting to show us is that the human shape perception system is tuned to detect differences. So the more we uh, encourage or uh, sort of match up the smaller and smaller number of differences, the higher discrimination we're going to get in these cases. So one could, one could think that this is, uh, you know, uh, research that would suggest a biasing on the part of those uh, making these types of decisions. Now the question is, and, and one that's very important to experts like myself, is should judges and juries actually be making these kinds of determinations? And, and this is a, I just put a, a um, diagram up here on the screen. Uh, this is work from uh, Daniela Bueller in uh, London. Uh, she uh, is a PhD, uh, just finished her PhD. And she developed this tool, and essentially what this tool does <laughs> is it positions a product in the center, uh, and it positions like products around the outside, and you, and you ask uh, uh, research, uh, respondents to move, drag the uh, objects closer or further away to the center object. Uh, now what's interesting about this, uh, and what's important, is that a methodology like this allows you to randomize the presentation of the stimulus, standardize the presentation of the three-dimensional objects themselves, and to do a form of a sort of basic conjoint analysis, what you end up with in the end is actually an objective measure of the relationship between the accused, the patented, and the product. And this is what uh, Perry was talking about. So these types of tools are going to find their way into these uh, types of uh, analyses. Uh, this second um, <coughs> principle, very well uh, known, this is uh, from uh, Stephen Palmer, a uh, well-known piece here. Um, and the question is, what impact does uh, prior experience have on our evaluation of the shapes or the similarity of shapes? Now, when this first came up, you probably saw this as random dots. Um, once you see the Dalmatian in this, what's important about this, and of all of you now, have you detected the dog? Okay. <laughs> what's important from a cognitive science point of view is once you structure your visual perception in this way in a complex field, 
you can never go back. Mm. So what this shows us, and what the uh, cognitive science is beginning to show in an even more robust way, is that we make decisions about similarities and differences almost instantaneously, and we do so in a way that can't be dialed back. So when you're uh, presenting uh, you know, at, uh, at a jury trial, the way in which the material is presented, the order of the material, uh, the way in, which it's, way in which it's categorized, we believe now, based on the science, is going to have a very big impact on how it's actually perceived. Uh, fascinating uh, additional field of research. Uh, it's the difference between actual shape and perceived shape. And as uh, lawyers, experts, uh, design patent um, law tells us that what is in the design patent is actually structurally what the uh, ordinary observer sees. But we now know from an extensive uh, field of research that what we see is actually, uh, what we perceive can be substantially different than what is actually uh, structural. Okay, so I'm just gonna move along here quickly. In this previous uh, slide here, you see the cat. Um, and then if I remove context, uh, what we now see are abstracted symbols which, have, uh, which are the actual physical object. But the difference between the perceived and the physical uh, is something that we now know uh, has a big impact. This is especially important when brand names are associated with the visual design of products. So for example, a famous study uh, done in London, they looked at teapots and uh, they evaluated the visual attributes of these teapots, their shininess, their quality of design. Second study, they put the names of the manufacturers up there, the Alessi teapot. I don't even know that's a very high quality design teapot. It was judged as better designed, more shiny, and a, um, a better representation of, uh, of what they thought was excellent design. Uh, okay, we'll save this for, if anybody has a question about Apple, Samsung. <laughs> okay. Uh, this uh, final piece here, uh, one, one of the other uh, aspects of, of uh, uh, shapes uh, perception research that we see is going to have a big impact in design patent litigation especially is this whole idea that formatting the comparison of the accused and the patented uh, in a way that reduces extraneous stimulus. This is a concept very well known in sensation perception research. Uh, this is a case um, that I worked on with uh, Keller, uh, Sloan, and Roman, uh, actually up here in San Francisco. Um, and the case involves this bicycle frame. And uh, the uh, infringed, uh, accused infringing product is on the right. So this methodology actually is really quite simple, but well understood in science. And that is, uh, we took the perspective view, which you just saw, and now we've translated the accused, uh, the patented design into, um, a, and the photograph into a side view. Uh, we've then stripped all of the elements away. And in fact, what we do in the next step is we take the, the actual patent drawing, we put it in Photoshop, and we put a 50% uh, filter on it, transparency, and we have a professional photographer exactly overline the patented design with the infringed design. So what you actually end up with, now here's the patented and the infringed design painted white, uh, and there it is converted to the actual same exact line drawing style as the patent. So what we've done is extracted extraneous, we've taken away extraneous stimulus, and we've created a compatible format. Uh, then you can go one step further, and once you have them in this format, uh, you can do various forms of technical analysis. This is just known as a transformational alignment. So when you present, or you think about presenting uh, similarities and differences, the ability to structure the stimuli for the judge and jury is, is going to be extremely important in the future. And. Um, I don't want to spend any time on this, but once you have that stimulus created in that way, there's a wealth of existing uh, psychoperceptual research that can be applied to the evaluation of similarities and differences. If there are any judges in the room, don't get the wrong idea here, but I'm really not convinced as an expert in this field that this level of uh, evaluation of similarity and differences should be in the hands of a judge and jury. It's actually the science now is much more complex than we thought. Uh, this is Perry's uh, example of Perry's chart, that same case. Uh, here we see uh, the accused and the infringing uh, closer uh, to each other than to the prior art. It's a relatively robust prior art field. Uh, okay, thank you.
Okay, this is the fun part. This is where everybody gets to chime in, ask questions. We're going to present some real live actual cases. I want to know from you if you think they are sufficiently distinct and we don't need to look at the prior art, or if you would actually like to know what the prior art looks like. Sufficiently distinct. All right, this is, a, this is the Minka case, the one that did this original division. These are uh, standards for mounting lighting fixtures outdoors. So, show of hands, you're not going to be graded. How many think the patented and accused designs are sufficiently distinct? No need to look at the prior art. Let's throw this case out of court. How many think you'd like to look at the prior art to get some context? <laughs> I have a bias here. I have a bias. All right, let's have a look at the prior art anyway. <laughs> the court felt that they didn't need to do that, and the motion for summary judgment uh, of non-infringement was granted. But, you know, let's look at it, guys. Okay, there you have it. So I've looked at this a long time. How many now think that there might be a case of infringement. In other words, the motion for summary judgment of non-infringement should be denied. I'm not saying the patentee wins or loses. I'm saying maybe this is a jury case. How many think that? How many think, ah, it's a loser anyway, the patentee, throw them out? Okay, so I've looked at this a long time and I identified three features that were common to the patented and accused designs which were not in the prior art. Namely, the, uh, the top and the bottom, which uh, curly cues there, they, they rotate clockwise, and then the substantially vertical piece that connects the top and the bottom. And those three features in combination are not found in the prior art, and I would suggest a good litigator could make their case that, that not necessarily they win, but this is not a motion for summary judgment of non-infringement that should be granted. Here's a case where the judge said, oh, we better look at the prior art. Patented, accused designs, and the prior art. This is where the, what, what I called the three-way visual test comes in, all right? So we're going to have another show of hands. You're not being graded, but Chris, take pictures, please. <laughs> okay, so how many think the patented and accused designs are closer to each other than either is to that prior art, and therefore infringement is made out? Show of hands. How many think either the patented or accused design is closer to the prior art than they are to each other, and therefore no infringement? Show of hands. Well, that's exactly what the court found. The prior art has a blade shape far more similar to the patented design than the accused product. Notice the overlapping fan blades that are common to the patented design and the prior art. Notice all the, also the shape of the blades. So no infringement, and I think that's the right decision. Oh, Dennis, your cupcake case. <laughs> Now, this case has the virtue of not having been decided yet, right? So you can really sit here as, as the, the judge or the finder of fact. I went, I went ahead and threw the prior art up there. Uh, and there are all kinds of dividers that you put in, you know, these cake pans. Um, so, just looking at these, are the patented and accused designs sufficiently distinct that we should not even look at the prior art and there's no infringement? How many say that? <laughs> How many think we ought to look at the prior art and get some context for that judgment? And of those who have your hands up right now, put your hands back up. How many think that there's infringement? Keep your hands up if you do. <laughs> Well, I applaud you, because at least you, you get to the part of saying, let's look at the prior art, and even in light of that, there may not be infringement, right? We don't know how this case is going to come out, and I think it's going to be discussed in the functionality part of, of, uh, of the presentation a little bit later on. Um, I have 
Uh, I was going to say no opinion, but I do have an opinion. <laughs> I think that this is a classic case, a classic case of a designer, inventor going to their patent attorney and being misguided to a utility patent, I mean to a design patent instead of a utility patent. This guy had a good idea and the idea was let's make a cupcake divider, I mean a divider in a cake pan in the shape of a cupcake. And if he had got, he could get a utility patent claim on it, I could draft it, it's useful, right? And the accused design would infringe it. But, you know, he wanted to go on the cheap, get a design patent. Oh, yeah, the rest of the panel, you don't have to sit there mute. <laughs> Please, speak up. <laughs> no, really. So if you jump back to your first example of the standard. This one? Yeah. So maybe, maybe it's really a matter of design patent scope, which Elmer says is very narrow. Why would it be that looking at the prior art gives you a broader claim scope than not looking at the prior art? Well, my point is, if you're asking me personally, I'm asking you personally. Not, looking, you do seem to have lot, not looking at the prior art just doesn't give you a frame of reference at all in which to judge the similarity. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the prior art is crowded, if there's all kinds of stuff around it, then like, like the court said, small differences can be important and can be magnified. But if the prior art is in left field, then we can stand some differences between the patented and accused designs that you might not ordinarily think would be a foundation for infringement. Professor. I think another uh, way to get at what Michael's getting at is, uh, under an ordinary observer test, you might look at two things and say, those things are sufficiently dissimilar that I don't care what the prior art is. They're not close. And then in that analysis, prior art would serve only to further limit uh, infringement in a circumstance where you would otherwise think, yeah, these things look right. pretty similar. If those similarities look like they come from, or at least are close to the prior art, then we, we might want to further narrow infringement. Uh, but you might do the gatekeeper analysis in the first instance mm -hmm. and say, you know what, these two things just don't look anything alike. Yeah, like these two things. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Or and, and I think you know I think the cake example is a great example of that, right? Because the prior art you put up there, I, I'm, I'm taking your word in that that's the closest prior art there is. Um, it is. That's got nothing. <laughs> that's got nothing to do with these two designs, right? But I don't think it follows from that fact that therefore there's infringement. You could say those two designs are sufficiently different that I don't care what the prior. Art is. Well, and this is exactly the problem with the whole concept of a sliding scale approach. Effectively, where you put prior art on one side, you put the patented design on the other side, you put the accused design right in the middle, and then you say, you know, is it closer to the prior art, hence non-infringement, or is it closer to the patented design, and then hunts infringement. And that last part doesn't follow, okay, because those things still could look not look alike. I mean, take, for example, a situation where you had a cell phone, and go back in time maybe to early 1990s, where you had this sort of this chunky uh, flip phone, okay, um, and, and there's a famous uh, inventor named Col Tony Colito, you might see this, he probably has the most amount of Federal Circuit opinions ever written about him, everyone negative. Um, but uh, uh, in any event, his cell phone, is, it's a very coarse idea of this flip phone. But if you were to compare that to the prior art, it was quite a leap. I mean, what existed prior to that, it looks quite different for him. So now you compare that to maybe a, sleek, a sleeker looking clamshell phone circa, let's go within 14 years, say 2003 or something like that, putting all stuff back in that time period. Is it closer? Is that chunky flip phone closer to that sleek cell phone than anything in the prior art? Yeah, it is. It, it certainly is. But does that mean that there's infringement? And I think you know you have to be cautioned that this this is really just a rule of thumb. This idea of this relative test, or at least I would submit that that it's just a relative test, a good rule of thumb, maybe for attorneys sitting down at their desk trying to give a quick opinion on infringement. But to say that it equates to infringement, I, I would I would highly caution that. Yeah, nobody should say it, it equates to infringement. I don't disagree that there might not be a holding of infringement in this case. Well, I mean, also the prior art in this situation here. Let, let's 
let's take a moment to think, what is the prior? What should populate that third panel of the analysis? I mean, in this particular situation, he's looking at, this is the cited prior art on the face of the patent. And it goes back earlier to our discussion as to, you know, what did the patent office dig up in, in their, in their uh, examination? But of course, it is the prerogative of both even though the Egyptian goddess says it's the defendant's prerogative to populate and bring forth prior art, and presumably in an attempt to try to shrink the scope of the claim. But sometimes the patentee will want to do this too, because if he can show that, the, or he or she can show that the patented design is quite disparate from the prior art, then you get this notion, wow, that really was a pioneering design. And the fact that this accused design is sort of cuddled up to it, that, be, that is actually illuminated when you show that the prior art is quite far. So uh, you know, maybe as this case proceeds through interrogatories, through discovery process, more pr prior art will be augmenting the pool, and therefore it, will, it starts changing. But it does bring this question is, should the scope of a design patent, is it so it's never known the date it's issued? It always seems to be it's contingent upon the prior art that's unveiled during a litigation. Well, that's a huge problem in addition to the fact that uh, you know, Perry's presentation made me go back and look at Egyptian goddess again. I see no support for this broadening use of mm -hmm. prior art. None. I mean, it seemed like this, the Federal Circuit expressly saw the prior art as a way to limit the scope of a patent. And again, for the predictability reasons that Chris brought up, I think that's really important. You know, is, it, is the scope of your patent going to depend on just what someone can dig up in a Minka lighting catalog, which are extensive, I can tell you. <laughs> There's a lot of prior art out there. So these are important questions we need to be talking about. The other thing that's uh, interesting, I think, as well, is when you have a, specifically, let's take the patented design, the, the fundamental um, property that's important in shape and, and its role in, in our world as we look around here is the ability to look at something and put it into a category instantaneously. That's the number one process that takes, takes place uh, cognitively. So when you look at just this patented design, and you don't see kinder cake up here. In fact, you may find in other uh, bodies of prior art, like say um, ice uh, scrapers for windows or other types of products, you may actually find prior art that's relevant to that specific visual design. Because that design does not suitably differentiate itself for categorization in, as a three-dimensional entity in, you know, in our world. So you could, you could expand the prior art uh, to other categories, I think, in some cases. This happens to be one of those cases. Most you cannot. And I think what's happening here, too, they're, they're limiting this prior art based upon it, sort of an analogous art type of limitation. But, but if we take our sort of thought process through anticipation or even through infringement, you were talking about toys and the actual car today. I mean, why, why can't this just be an image? I mean, I mean, why can't this just be an image of a cupcake? I'm sure you can find one in a catalog pre whatever this is of just the image, and why can't that also inform um, the, the the analysis? Um, and because we're always looking also at prior art, and we're talking about the scope of these designs. But uh, in the cell phone example, over time, remember these are the men and women of the jury box. They're going to come equipped with their everyday sensibilities and their experiences. So if they've become more equipped to to discriminating between different designs. You wonder that is the scope of a design patent strongest on the first day it's issued, okay? Because think about the think about the paradox there. Over time, your audience, their perceptions, they're becoming more acute at discerning differences, and so as time goes on, cell phones are a perfect example. People are becoming more and more uh, able to discern differences. So it's really a subject of perception. So it's so foreign to the utility patent world. Another example? Yeah. Bring it on. Yeah. This is my light at the end of the tunnel. You know my bias, right? My bias, let's look at the prior art. So you have the revision military case from uh, District of Vermont. They said, this isn't particularly close. We don't have to look at the prior art. Preliminary injunction denied. This is what they, this is what they found. The shape of the lenses are different. The bridge is concave, crowned by six vents but the accused goggles protrude outwardly and have no vents. The patented goggles have hexagonal vents in two rows. The venting on the accused goggles is circular and occupies two to three rows. Sufficiently distinct? How many think that these two are sufficiently distinct? Let's throw them out. Show of hands. How many want to see the prior art to inform them? Yeah. 
<laughs> Let's have a look at the prior art anyway. So there's the prior art. Bada boom. Case went up to the Federal Circuit. There was a decision in November. Federal Circuit said, well, although individual features may help you uh, in assessing the overall appearance, it's often helpful to refer to the prior art that is familiar to an ordinary observer. The district court did not consider the prior art. Although the court said it was not a particularly closed case, the record suggests otherwise. So this is pretty significant case. I think it's the first time the Federal Circuit has said this sufficiently distinct thing um, doesn't work when you have prior art that is this close. Also, on remand, the court, uh, the Federal Circuit admonished the district court that they uh, had to consider the design as a whole and not deconstruct it into its particular features. So they didn't say infringement or not. They said, let's look at the prior art. It's going to have an impact. Okay, before you take Comment? I, I want to jump in on that. Um, I think it's important to notice in this case, the Federal Circuit didn't actually say there's close prior art, so we have to look at it, or that it's going to be broader because there's prior art. It was a minor issue on appeal. They didn't push it really hard in their briefs. It was certainly there. Um, but again, this isn't something that I think is as much of a light at the end of the tunnel as maybe Perry would like. <laughs> well, the, the, district, the district court said it's not a particularly close case. The Federal Circuit said it is a particularly close case. They disagreed with that. Yeah, but the design art consists solely of design patents. No. There are a hell of a lot of sunglasses out there. <laughs> yes, there are. It depends what the litigants bring to the table, you know, in litigation. I mean, there's prior art up the wazoo. And Google will someday straighten all this out for us. <laughs> we're, we're or there. make it accessible, I should say. Make it accessible. Yeah. Yes? I think in this case that they found there's no likelihood of success on infringement. So, so they, just never looked at the they didn't look at validity, I believe. It seems like that would be tied up As memory serves. Yeah, I think you're right. But my memory isn't what it used to be. Yes? Let me quote Charles. Human shape perception is tuned for detection of differences. People, judges, can look at that and they say, oh, these are hexagonal. Oh, these are round. Oh, there's three rows here. There's two rows there. That's what, that's what the human eye notices. Well, because I, I think historically, some people have to basically look at the design at the same time. They look at the product. They I also think it is decided in the first 15 seconds uh, in front of the court or in front of the jury. They either think they're alike or not. Well, I, I, I think on the, on the point with the prior art, remember, we're only September 22, 2008 is when Egyptian goddess comes down. Okay, so that's the first time really we're getting into this world where you're considering the, the relationship of three things at the same time. Prior to that, with the point of novelty test, you would look at your patented design, you would look at the prior art, and find differences. So you're only comparing two things. Then you'd find those, those points of uh, novelty. Then you would look at the, uh, the accused design. And you see, are those things embodied in the accused design? So you're, you were never comparing three things at once. And, and now we're sort of entering this new world. We're only really a few years out in, into doing this, of the, sort of the three-way analysis. And, and to be clear with that term, uh, it's sometimes bandied about in some of the case law now. What, what is the three-way test or something? You know, Let's be clear that there's this notion of the sliding scale when you put the, the prior art, you put the uh, patented design, accused product in the middle, is it closer, that sort of relativity test. And then there's this notion of just a three-way test in the sense that you're always, your, pri your, your primary inquiry is the patented and accused design, but in your rear view mirror, you always keep in that, that frame of contact Perry was talking about, the prior art. Th those are really two fundamentally different things because the first one's a relative test. The second one is really you're just focusing on the two things, but you're cons considering the, the, the prior art. Chris and I have been arguing about this for five years now. <laughs> we'll Should figure we? it out today. Yes. I apologize for my ignorance. I don't know if there's a doctrine similar to the contrary doctrine of synthesis there. My issue is that I have this, this example that you did, and essentially what's a slow one there, 
that's the way things look. And so I don't know how we can pull that into the consideration, like with the kitty can. That's how a cupcake looks. And I expect cupcake looking things to look like that. And I don't know it comes into the analysis, but it seems to me that's really a thing, the baseline that I start with is not even all these things. Uh, that's a decent lead into our next, the next half of our panel, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if we have some time, I mean, I have dozens of examples. If we have some time later, we'll go back to them. Definitely. Unless you want to take some of Chris's time. <laughs> Let's have a show of hands. <laughs> <laughs> What's the prior art? You got me. Well, he, he would kill me if I took a show of hands. Because I know any of these really tickle your fancy. Look at this stuff. <laughs> All right, Karani, you're coming up. There we go. All right. Thank you. Well, I don't want to chew up too much of, of my time, but I recall when I was a law clerk working with uh, Judge Palmeyer in Chicago, I had a design patent case, and I uh, didn't was just at a loss for looking for any type of scholarship. I mean, we we're getting some great scholarship from uh, from the academy now, but there wasn't there was a paucity, and so I looked out there and I found these articles by none other than Mr. Perry Sedman, and I recall as a young law clerk, uh, I called him up, picked up the phone, called him, and just started picking his brain. He spent about an hour and a half on the phone. He says, "Wow, that's really cool." There's a you know senior attorney giving me this all this time. Well, now I've learned after all these years that he just wanted someone to talk to. But, <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, Perry has certainly been a pioneer in this, in, this, in this area. True, true. No one else wanted to talk about design. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm tasked with talking about this interesting issue of, of functionality. And you know, as the questioner was talking about you know, copyright law, we have this sort of merger doctrine. And in, in trade dress law, we certainly have functionality. But there's an own breed of functionality when it comes to design patents. So one of the things I wanted to talk to was, you know, why are we so concerned with this functionality doctrine? I, a lot of times in the, in, the, in, the, in the writings and the scholarship, I hear this notion that, oh, it's the province of utility patents. But to me, that's, that's sort of an unsatisfying act, uh, answer. I mean, this is a discrete intellectual property right. Why are we, just the fact that it might bleed into some other uh, property right doesn't necessarily mean that that's the reason that we should be concerned with it. After all, Section 35 U.S.C. 171 of the Patent Act says that it be, needs to be new, ornamental, and, uh, and uh, original. And so it doesn't say non-functional. It says it has to be ornamental. So so long as it's ornamental, it seems like you're meeting the statutory requirements. Well, I want to be very clear about what we're talking about when we're talking about functionality. Because there's a lot of confusion in the case law. And there really are two discrete, separate and discrete uh, inquiries when we're talking about this idea of functionality. The first is an affirmative defense to, this, to the extent that it's about validity. And in that, we're, we're concerned with the overall appearance. Is the overall appearance of the claimed design functional okay, or non-ornamental? The second works its way into, well, it's worked its way right now into this idea of claim construction. And this is this Richardson issue which we're going to touch upon. So let me give a couple examples of what I'm talking about when we're talking about the validity side. Okay, This is validity functionality. These are some examples that I've sort of just, just cobbled together. But effectively, we have three, three design patents, three separate distinct design patents. And the first design patent, you see it's on the overall appearance of the ski. Everything's in solid lines. If you recall earlier, we were saying solid lines, just the fundamental rule, generally. Fundam solid lines, part of the claim. Dotted lines, for instance, here, not part of the claim design. So here, the question that, that's been articulated by the Federal Circuit is, is the overall appearance of the claim design dictated by function? This is this notion of this, what they've been called the multiplicity of forms theory, in the sense that, are there other ways? Has any design actually gone into this? Or is it the mere fact of the idea of what you're trying to do? Is this the only way that it could spit it out? Is this the only way that this, could, this, this item could look? Well, of course, there's a constant battle as to what, what, is this, what is the function of this item. But here, for instance, this could, the, the monkey on the top of the key, on the keyhole, could look quite different, right? I mean, that doesn't have to be a monkey. That could be a, a tiger, an elephant, or Perry Sedman. 
Um, now, in the second example, you'll get there, Perry, you'll get there. In the second example, now we've sort of paired back. We've gotten rid of this particular keyblade, and now we're just claiming the top. And so the same question, is the overall appearance of that portion which is claimed dictated by its function? Well, it's only to hold the key, so not, not, it could probably take, uh, take myriad forms. So that one I think we're okay. Now you come over to this one, and this is sort of the tricky one, because you're just claiming the keyblade. This is really based off a real case, uh, the best lock case that goes back to the Fed Circuit in 1997. And we were just talking about the keyblade. Now that's all that's being claimed. Remember, we're talking about validity here. Is that keyblade dictated by its function? And the Federal Circuit in this particular case, in the best lock case, held that indeed it was. That keyblade was dictated by its function. There is no other form that that could take. And you wonder, uh, that opinion, that's, that's been out there. In fact, that's the only, as much as we talk about functionality, that's the only published Federal Circuit opinion where a design patent has been held invalid on the account of in, in the functionality. This is the only one, is this best lock case. A few other district court cases. So, because as long as we've, we've been beholden to this idea of the multiplicity of forms theory, if you can show other types of designs could achieve the function, therefore, therefore you're in the clear. Now, but doesn't that beg the question, what is the function? Okay, who's to say that this keyblade is designed to matingly engage a particular keyhole? I mean, that's not in the four corners of the document, right? That's not there, we don't see it there. I mean, this key could be a, maybe a charm you put around your girlfriend's neck, right? It doesn't have to take this form, or it could be a toy, right? It could be a toy. So it doesn't have to take this form. So you wonder if the court sort of looked at these externalities to arrive at this particular decision. But again, the key here with this first inquiry is validity. The validity of the patent is the overall appearance. Now, let's go to the second inquiry here. This is this whole Richardson issue. This is where it's this never ending, uh, the, the thirst of the judiciary and, uh, and accused infringers to try to dissect design patents into constituent parts. And what we have here, here's the key. The, the uh, patentee claimed the entire key. And now the question what has been asked in this Richardson case is, is the appearance of the claim design feature dictated by function? We're talking about features now. So now we're gonna go down from a macro level down to a micro level on a granular level. And the question is, is this portion, should this be considered when you're having an infringement determination with this particular keyblade? You see that there's differences up top, but should the similarities, the gross similarities with the key uh, blank portion itself, should that be considered when we're determining infringement? In Richardson v. Stanley Works is the case where this sort of reared its head, 2010. And on my slide, I generally like to, to lay them out chronologically. So the, the prior art on the left here, but here's the main event over here. This, this bracket here is the patent and the accused design, but it's always going chronological from left to right. <laughs> and if you're asking the comparison between these two, to me this seems like one of those cases that maybe it is uh, sufficiently distinct, such that we didn't even have to look at the prior art. I mean, these two particular devices seem quite different. In fact, I would submit that this the accused design, the Stanley Fubar, I'm not kidding, that was the name of the product. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that's, what it, that's what an industrial designer does. It sort of takes something that looks like this and turns it into something that looks cool. Um, but what the court doesn't do here, it doesn't just sort of simply rely upon Egyptian, Egyptian goddess or Gorham v. White and, and ask the question, are these two substantially similar? No, it's the, the, the never-ending uh, temptation to get in there and, and wrestle with the claim. And where, where the grounding for this is an Egyptian goddess. You have the 2008 opinion. As we know, they said, general rule, don't do verbalizations. Don't take a ceiling fan, look at it, and have your law clerk write up a 500 word recitation as to what, the, what how to interpret that design. The images speak for themselves. What the court says, the features of the claim design that are purely ornamental and those that are purely functional, that the court can usefully can guide the fact finder. So the sort of the door is a little open, a couple years later, Richardson picks up on that. And what Richardson says here is that each of these elements, he says there are several elements that are driven purely by utility, and he points out these features, the handle, the hammerhead, the jaw, the crowbar, purely by function, there's really no other way. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of these, these uh, constituent elements that have been there for a long time. It seems like there's other ways to design this. But here's the rub, is what do you do with those features once you have identified 
even if they are purely functional, even if a particular aspect, element, or feature is purely functional, what do you do with it? Well, the court uses this word, they should be discounted, ignored, or factored out, okay? So that's sort of where, where, where that leaves us here. There's one other brief case that I'm gonna mention here, and then we're gonna open up for a panel discussion, but it's the Elmer case, which goes back to 1995, talking about Judge Lurie penning this opinion, <coughs> and in this particular case, the court, the, the patentee, there was two particular elements, this protrusion, this were for a pizza box, I guess you put it on your pizza so it doesn't get smashed when it's being delivered, and you've got this protrusion at the top, and you've got the support ribs. Well, lo and behold, those two particular features do not show up in the defendant's accused product. So the clever plaintiff patentee says, you know what, There's, those are functional features. Let's, let's, you know, Your Honor, can we just siphon off those features? Well, the Federal Circuit comes back and says, no, 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 no. Regardless of whether features such as the support ribs and protrusions are functional, the elements are depicted in solid lines and thus they are part of the claim design. So as we go to the next phase of this uh, presentation, keep in mind, should we be tinkering with these designs? Should we be getting in there and siphoning, factoring out features? After all, we were taught over and over again for the last 100 years that design is the amalgam, the tot ensemble, it's the combination of all the particular features of a design and whether or not we should be siphoning off these features. So, I will bring it over to Charles. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so let's talk about um, what we do here um, from a formal product design point of view. Uh, if we want to identify features which we uh, believe uh, are actually uh, functional. So, uh, these are uh, some scales here. Uh, the, these are attributes that well, we can, you can look at when you examine a design patent. For example, do you have ergonomically defined features, uh, industry standard requirements, we know that from the utility patent space, uh, engineering performance uh, determined features, and production process features. So as a formal methodology, you can take a design patent, and Chris and I have been back and forth about this for a long time. Uh, this is a case uh, that I worked on, uh, the case settled. Uh, this was uh, BNR Plastics versus Kickerland, I believe. Uh, we have the um, patented design on the left and the accused design on the right. So if you, one were to apply this functionality test to this type of uh, design patent, what might the outcome be? And this is an example uh, of an actual uh, work from uh, the uh, from the actual expert report. So looking at the ergonomic requirements, one of the first things we're interested in is, this is a 97.5 percentile uh, male foot positioned on the top of the deck. So what we're trying to define here is, are the physical proportions of the product determined by underlying ergonomic human performance requirements? So we can establish here that this, say the size of this proportion of the deck on top was dictated by that. So then uh, you can also look at industry standards. So for example, in this, in this case we looked at uh, the specific rung height of step stools. And we find, in fact, that it's exactly the same height as dictated by um, these industry standards. So what you've done now is you've functionally carved out sort of the top shape and the, and the top and the uh, vertical proportion. So then you can look at it a little further. For example, this is from the engineering analysis, and we realize that when you have a step stool, the, the legs have to cant out slightly from the upper surface. Otherwise, the step stool will flip over when you uh, position your foot on the side of the stool. So now what we've captured is the top, the height, and the angles of view, uh, the angles on the side of the step stool. Now, we could say from a, uh, an, an analytical point of view that these are now functional attributes of the visual design claimed in the design patent. Um, so then the next thing you can look at is the production uh, derived requirements. It turns out that this product by BNR is extremely clever. They, what they did was they used only three molds and they produced the entire stool. So what happens is you produce a mold and the parts are symmetrical, so they flip them and snap them. So what you actually see now is that these functional requirements, uh, production requirements over here on the uh, right um, are not uh, the same, I, I actually dictate that design as opposed to those on the left. So now you've taken the functional analysis to the next level. So what you end up with if you want to look at this sort of as the functional envelope of the design claimed uh, attributes of the product, is this physical representation. And it's very interesting to take this kind of approach in almost any product that you may be uh, looking at. And as a matter of fact, it, the group together talked about the cupcake case. We're going to do that in just a minute. And it's, it's very revealing. So the question then becomes, um, 
what functional, what features, design features remain in the overall claimed functional shape, uh, design shape. So the key point here and where the cognitive science comes into this is that you cannot extract, as claimed in Richardson, physical features from the de design pack. You can attenuate them visually, and that's essentially what is done here. These, uh, the main line drawings from the design patents and the accused are filtered back at about a 70% level, and the actual uh, non-functional design features are retained in red. So what you have is the extraction of these features based on uh, the functional analysis uh, as defined in those four key variables. So we have the cupcake case. So if we apply the same uh, methodology uh, to this, uh, and first of all, we extract, uh, we um, take Perry's photograph and uh, subject it to a line drawing, put it in the same visual format that we have here. Uh, then when we look at the actual attributes of the cupcake uh, divider itself, are there any physical attributes of that product that are actually dictated by function? So the first thing we want to look at is industry standard. And it turns out when you actually look at cupcake pans, they're highly standard. Why are they standard? Because of those little paper inserts that have to go into cupcake pans. So here you have an industry standard which is essentially deriving, uh, deriving the structured um, visual presentation of the entire bottom half of the, of the visual form as claimed in the design pattern. You can then look at um, ergonomics and what you see is that the size of the, the portions on the top, the grips, uh, their relative orientation, the height above the uh, fill line on the, uh, on the tray, all of these can be technically thought of as functional as well. So you have now defined a, or I would guess a better way to you sort of dissected the design patent for its functional attributes. Incidentally, Chris and I go back on this all the time, so we're not totally in agreement on this. Uh, and then, of course, you can um, define those elements which are actually truly ornamental. So in this design, and same analysis here. <clears throat> so what you have now are those features which are uh, truly ornamental. Now what's important is the major contributors to the overall impression of similarity are the functionally derived elements. That is the key point here. So you have to make sure that when you do this type of analysis, and incidentally this case just happens to fit beautifully with this type of work. Many cases do not, but this is the type of um, sort of analytical processes that are starting to find its way into these cases. We really want to open this up for panel discussion and also to take questions. So these slides will simply serve as a jumping off point to foster that. Um, but I, different than Perry's setup where he was sort of um, shuffling the situations where you have plainly dissimilar and those were sufficiently distinct, uh, we have separated these into two distinct uh, categories regarding inquiry one and inquiry two, validity and this claim construction notion. Because uh, if there's anything we can do as practitioners in the audience is to try to aid the judiciary to try to make sure that there's not that confusion in the case law because there's quite a bit of it right now. Okay, so this is an example of a particular uh, district court case where there was a finding that this particular design uh, and probably another multifunction tool wasn't found to be invalid because they says that it was largely functional. Again, not using the, maybe the more stricter standard of dictated, which seems to be more of an absolute sense, but more of the permissive standard of largely functional. So, so maybe I'd like to just open it up for the, my, my co-panelists and see if they have any any thoughts as to the propriety of this holding or maybe factors that should be worked into it? I have not seen a single design during this presentation that is invalid for being functional. Not one. Let me explain. I think courts screw this up more than any other thing in design patent law. You have to analyze this properly for me you have to think of the underlying purpose of the functionality doctrine. And the underlying purpose is you cannot get a design patent to protect that which you can only protect with the utility patent. That's the underlying purpose. And when you think about that, then you easily get to the conclusion that you can 
defend against the charge of functionality by proving that there are alternate designs that don't look like the patented design that perform substantially the same function. Because if you prove that, then you prove you're not monopolizing that function. There's other ways to embody it. Now, every single element in every design patent has functional features, individual features, and overall features that perform functions. This does not mean that the, that the design patent itself, the patented design, is legally functional as a matter of law. Those functional features can and are, in every single case I have seen, ornamental. There is, uh, courts screw this up all the time, just like in this case. They see elements that are functional, functional, functional. In the Richardson case, this performs a function, that performs a function. The fact is you can only get design patents on, quote, articles of manufacture, unquote. And if your design doesn't perform some sort of a function, go get yourself a copyright or hang it up in, in MoMA because you're in, the, you're in the wrong IP department here. <laughs> you need to straighten out the courts. Just because that element performs a function does not mean it is legally functional as a matter of law. So I challenge, and I've given out this challenge many, many times, if anybody can show me a novel design that cannot be embodied by any other design and perform substantially the same function, I will buy you dinner. At Wendy's. Oh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Novel. So I'd like to show you one. What I'm going to suggest is that the fact that you uh, uh, made that point so effectively suggests that that's not the right test for functionality. It's not the test for functionality we use in trademark law. Right? It is not the case that if I could show a single alternative or even five alternative ways of doing something, uh, that therefore it's non-functional. Uh, so one possibility is we want to we need a test for functionality that's broader uh, than the one you've articulated. Another possibility is that we're asking the wrong question when we're asking is your patent invalid for functionality, and where, where, where functionality belongs is in the infringement piece, right? And so that, uh, when Christopher gets up and he says, hey, look, the only similarities these muffin uh, separators have are the functional elements. Um, that's got to be, that's got to be relevant, right, to the, I'm sorry, maybe it was Charles and not Christopher. Uh, uh, that's got to be relevant to the infringement analysis, whether or not we think that the presence of these non-functional ornamental elements ought to save the rest of the time. Well, you're dissecting, I would, I would challenge, you're dissecting the claim design. Those elements are only functional if there's no other way to make them look to perform substantially the same function. And I disagree with you. I think the same problems in design patent functionality are found in trade dress functionality. Just look at the Becton Dickinson case from, from the Federal Circuit, or was it the board, uh, that was decided last year. Same exact thing. They picked out functional feature after functional feature, and they said, this is all functional. We can't give you trade dress protection. Now, there's other factors in, analysis, in the analysis of trade dress, but this alternate design thing, I think, I think courts just get blocksied up when they talk about functional features that are, that are not necessarily legally functional. I think Judge Rich had a very, very good discussion of this in the Morton Norwich case. And he suggested that all the features that perform a function should be called de facto functional, but the overall design or the design features are not impermissibly functional if they are de jure functional. And you have to, you have to take this to court. You have to help the, the judge or the finder of fact distinguish between de facto functional and de jure functional. You know, th this, uh, you can see, even with this discussion, we've, we've gone from talking about functionality in the validity context, and now we're already jumping down to an element by element uh, consideration, which is more this Richardson, Richardson issue. And then furthermore, you start confounding it. There's different policy considerations at stake with trademark trade dress law than there are in design patents. I mean, after all, we're talking about a right and potential perpetuity as opposed to a limited right. So I don't think it should be that strange that there should be a different test for each. 
Um, so anyways, let, let's just, just a couple more examples of, this is another example um, where you, the court had found, albeit this was on a preliminary injunction stage, but the court held that the design patent, uh, the overall design was dictated by function. That's the test that the court is using. So, uh, but again, this begs the question as to what is the function? You see, this is a battleground for litigants. I mean, a defendant's gonna try to say, oh no, this, this, uh, this forms, uh, you know, only try to give you uh, viewability or something like that, whereas the, the plaintiff will try to have a narrower function when they're trying to argue this particular issue. But it was a finding of invalidity. There are a hundred million different designs for that particular product. Mm -hmm. Right, minimum. Next, exa next example here is with respect to this uh, port or this cord, and you can see it's attaching. And this is the other side of the spectrum, uh, Professor Lemley, where, you're, where you find a situation where using the multiplicity of forms theory, we're saying, are there any other designs? If not, then uh, you can you have your answer on functionality. But here, they're listing these features, okay? These are sort of a factor-based test, which you're seeing on the other side of things. And uh, you, you certainly see uh, another situation where in the, the case Amini, there was a case, Amini versus uh, Anthony of California, where you see now the Federal Circuit pulling in trade dress principles from Polytex and in, in Wood Labs and those type of cases. But this is the factor-based analysis. And I don't know if any of the people on the panel would like to weigh in on uh, the factor analysis and whether or not that's proper or should we be dealing with just this multiplicity of forms theory. Incidentally, several countries in Europe have rejected the multiplicity of forms theory and are going with much more softer. Anyone? Well, that is, those, that list it, are the Morton Norwich factors. Right. That's what they are. They are the trade dress standards. And I think, Chris, that you are actually right in, in saying that trade dress standard for functionality should be easier to prove functionality in trade dress than design patents because of the potential infinite duration of trade dress protection. That makes sense to me. Should be more difficult, in other words, to prove design patent functionality because you're only talking about 14 years. Right. So, okay, uh, well, so those are, the, those are the ones we're talking about validity. Again, you're looking at the overall appearance of what the claim design is. And now we're gonna get into this notion of functionality, how it in fact or gets into claim construction vis-a-vis -vis the Richardson line of case law. And same case, now the idea here is that the court is talking about this particular feature here, and the court notes that indeed it could have been designed in an infinite number of ways, and therefore it will be part of the claim design. Um, but again, underneath this all, let's keep in mind, should we even be going through this exercise, this idea of parsing out post hoc features of the design. I mean, after all, the patent office themselves, they don't do this. They look at the overall, that's what they're discharged with, the overall appearance of the claim design. And now, after the fact, we're gonna dissect this, start eliminating, turning the design into effectively a piece of Swiss cheese. I wonder if we should be going through this exercise at all. Designers, I mean, just think about Pythagoras and, and, and the golden mean, right? I mean, the spatial relationship between particular elements in a design, what is it, 1.6? 1. 1. One eight or whatever, but between the two designs, there's the, the harmony between within the internally within a design. When we start siphoning off features, you, you ruin that spatial relationship between the elements. So, any panelists want to weigh in on this one, or anybody in the audience? I I think you can extract, uh, not physically extract, but I think you can you can attenuate features based on their functional presentation and retain the impression of the whole product. And I think that that, as a structural concept, is something that a designer is very familiar with. Because oftentimes when you think of design, especially industrial design, it's, it's a, like Perry said, it's a commercial embodiment of some type. So, I mean, structurally, I don't have a problem with it. I think if you actually remove the features, then you clearly have altered the perception of the shape. That's totally clear. So, so that's fair. So, you know, if you don't use this masking tape approach where you mask over certain features, but then I guess the next step, is that, you know, recently on a trip, I think a bunch of us were in the UK at Oxford speaking about this, and you, I listened to some of the Lord Justice Jacob talking about design. Well, you know, we don't have, they don't have a jury system over there. So this is, the ju this is the judge, he's able to weigh these considerations, perhaps attenuate was the word you use, some of these functional features. How would you suggest that this is communicated with the Seventh Amendment? How are you going to communicate to that effectively to a jury to say, you know, that feature should not be uh, considered? Well, I think you have to do it graphically, just to be very simple and direct with it. Uh, you know, much like some of the, the drawings I had up here, those are essentially uh, the patent drawings with the appropriate features uh, having a transparency applied to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not 
you know, I don't think we have a necessarily a, a structured working methodology, certainly nothing that the courts have adopted, but I think, uh, you know, psychophysically it will work because you can maintain the whole product and highlight those attributes which are, uh, I think, uh, resonant in, in the visual design. And the other thing I think, too, is that if you get to the point where you're, where you're pulling out these functional features, I think you're going to end up invalidating completely valid design innovations because if you, if you pull out, let's say that, you know, two features are pulled out, extracted, first of all, you've destroyed the perceptual shape, second of all, you've, you've invalidated the patent. So I think it gives a designer the option to retain some aspects of the design. Well, I'll, I'll pose it to the, to the panel here and then open it up. I mean, could you have an ornamental configuration of, of a series of purely functional elements? And, sure. and in that case, you know, what, what would you suggest to do? Because if we're to eliminate all of the constituent elements, it seems like you'll end up with nothing. I mean, how else are you going to set forth the configuration? So was there a question? Or? Out there. Uh, this gentleman in the back row. Yes, I agree with that in that illustration. Uh, and that was done specifically for, uh, that was an ITC matter done for the judge, uh, where we did, in fact, there's a lot of conversation with uh, counsel about how much, what the thickness of the red line should be, how, what, what is the conspicuity between the foreground and the background, and we chose a, you know, a much more aggressive approach. But uh, yeah, I think that's correct. Depends who you represent. <laughs> and so one of, one of the interesting things about this claim construction is the flip side of it is notice. And it's, it's very hard to imagine how someone at a competing company gets any kind of notice from these design patents. The, uh, the Elmer standard in that way is, is a pretty good standard because what the, you know, the dark lines are, what the claim is regardless of functionality. But here we're talking right. about taking out a bunch of pieces of functionality. Right, and fundamental pieces. I mean, what he's saying is effectively, you know, it's in solid lines, everybody knows what's part of the claim design, but you start after the fact, post hoc sort of tinkering with the claim, and sometimes it's fundamental changes. I mean, in a, in a utility patent, you could say, oh, it's the same thing, Chris, but really, those are sort of more on the margins. Here you could be slicing off 50, 60, 70 percent of the claim design after the fact. Where is your presumption of validity in that situation? I mean, after all, the PTO, they examined this of the overall appearance. It seems like the underpinnings for Section 282 are lost in that situation. Uh, All just, right, just one point, Chris. If, if, if you talk about the extraction or the attenuation of visual elements, there's, I think, very clear science that says that dotted lines in themselves do uh, create the basic uh, um, impression of a product is, is, is being different. So you can look at the science around that and say, okay, you've got a shape perception here and you've dotted out the, let's say, the, the outer piece. That in perceptual terms is actually a different design. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not the legal structure, I understand that, but I'm saying from a scientific point of view, you alter the perception of the product by adding dotted lines to it without question. Well, just to move to, I guess, another example here, this is the Great Neck Saw. Uh, Again, uh, prior art on the left side, moving in time to the patented design and the accused design on the right. You know, this would be your analysis for infringement. But what courts are doing vis-a-vis -vis Richardson is going to the next step and saying, given its functional nature, the blade lock means is not entitled to protection. So in a sense, you, know, you might be pulling out the, uh, the masking tape and covering over that approach, or as Ch Charles is saying, perhaps attenuating, maybe via a jury instruction, uh, to, to that point, but I, I just keep coming back to the thought of, you know, why, why bother? I mean, you can, I don't, uh, it seems like it's, uh, again, not appreciating the fact that design resides in the overall appearance of the claim design. Everything in that illustration performs a function, everything. Okay, so this is uh, the case that um, Charles was talking about, this BNR plastic step stool case. 
Uh, again, prior art on the left side of the page, patented design and the accused design. And uh, one of the issues that came up in this case was this issue of functionality. And um, this is something that, um, uh, you know, the notion of, is this functional, this hinge design? And there's a wonderful um, expert, uh, design patent expert, his name is Cooper Woodring. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with him. But in any event, you know, he, here's just some instances. And I don't think that when you're looking at functionality, are there alternative designs, does that have to be found in the prior art? I mean, this could be real time. You could just be looking at this right now. Are there real designs? So here's some examples of some other designs. But again, this comes down to what is the function? Does it have to, you know, the precise um, uh, functional relationship of each one of these components, how granular do you get when you're talking about what, what, what actual alternative designs there can be? Any thoughts from the panel on this one? Yeah, I want to comment on that. <laughs> uh, Cooper is the opposing expert. Uh, and it turns out that this, this chart actually was very helpful coming from the opposing expert because when you go to the next level of engineering analysis, what you realize of all these proposed alternatives is that several of them cannot be manufactured. So, and others are going to increase the cost of tooling to manufacture. So what actually Chris has put up here is a very good point. If you come back with a discussion that is uh, you know, going after the question of functionality, you better know what you're doing on the other side because at the end of the day, the changes that Cooper put up here were actually not valid. And the case settled before we got to that point. But the, <laughs> yeah. So you can see that there's this notion where Charles, as, as on the defendant side, is going to a very granular level. Is the physics, are the physics, the physical relationship between each one of these achieved in one precise way, whereas the plaintiff's attorney, or the plaintiff's side, might take a broader approach. I mean, all these have to do is matingly engage and, and provide the, the function of a hinge. Uh, question here on the red or green shirt. Yeah, I, you know, I think particularly when you're working in conjunction you know, on utility patents at the same time, it's often helpful to, in your utility patent, to include some alternative embodiments. Because if you're discussing about the function, it's the same drawings. I see a lot of people do that, use the same drawings for the utility patent for the design patent. I think you're setting yourself up for, for a pretty good uh, functionality challenge. Uh, go ahead, Beth. Yeah, yeah, you, you see these arguments in the alternative going back and forth, and sometimes it's nice if you're a plaintiff's attorney to show all these different alternative embodiments. Here's, you, know, you go to the Art Institute School of Design, ask them here, draw me 100 different designs, and then it's very powerful in front of a judge or a jury saying, and which one did the defendants choose? They chose our design. And so it's a way you can sort of a double it, I mean, you can, uh, sort of you can hit them both, from both sides. One, not only do you defeat functionality, but you also establish your, your uh, infringement case. Question in the front here? Why? Sort of uh, Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, is that in this design patent, there are later figures where you see it in a closed state. Okay, so I think in that particular instance, the argument you're talking about, you could say, well, it's static, so wh why should this stuff come into play? Which, you know, how the functional attributes of the hinge, they were included. But I still think it's a fair point. I mean, who, who, why, are we in, why are we imputing, you know, when Charles is talking about the, the physical relationships of these components, it seems like now he's talking about the product. And we really should be in a patent to product world not in a product-to-product -product world. Why are, we, why are we importing, it almost reminds me of the key lock case, why are we importing in the externality of the shape of the key hole into determining functionality as to the key blade? Uh, in, the, in the blue, and any panelists got any questions? Go ahead. Sure.
Yeah. And that, the expression that can happen here is uh, uh, fundamental functional to the filter out the elements or the functional elements, and then you get approximations. It, it, the orientation, I mean, the, the structure and organization of those functional elements can still be considered. Uh, and I think that's what we do with copyright, and it's been responsible for copyright, and we've all done it. Well, so but the. The, the big difference, I think, between copyright and design patents is you have a claimed design in design patents that undergoes examination and issues with a presumption of validity. In copyright, you don't have that. So you have to figure out in the first instance with an unexamined copyright registration what's protectable. So sure, apply those tests and play with it and figure it out. But a design patent has already gone through that process, presumably with expert design patent examiners. And <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I, 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 I think, <laughs> and I, I, I think the part about the scenes of fair doctrine um, is 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 a, is a wise one. But but understand that I believe that gets vetted if you do a proper uh, Egyptian goddess analysis, where you're looking at the prior art. If indeed, but, but, after, but, but if indeed that same combination shows up time and again in the prior art, or if you do even see it one time in the prior art, you're not the, visually, you will not be assigning uh, a large amount of visual weight to that particular item because it's shown in the prior art. And that's what Egyptian goddess was talking about, is saying the departure from the prior art, that will, that will carry uh, more weight in the, in the overall analysis. But I guess this idea of dissecting is something that, uh, you know, there's always a constant novel, non-novel features. That's what we got rid of in point of novelty. That's what the attempt was to do. And then you've got ornamental functional features or significant, insignificant features. Again, design, at least in my opinion, is the overall appearance as, as claimed, so far, so long as it meets the statutory requirements. Just one point I wanted to make about design alternatives, um, because I've used design alternatives, especially early in my career as an expert, and you can create very robust design alternatives uh, in the form of models. That's what industrial designers do every day. And um, in the legal context, when those are presented as design alternatives, what I found is oftentimes the judge will exclude those because they are not actual commercial product. So you have to be, I think, astute about how you use that um, as, a, as a concept. If you don't have actual functional prior art um, that's a commercial embodiment of some type, um, talking about design alternatives like hinges, then it's a problem. I have to request leave to respond to the 1% comment of <laughs> Professor Linda. 1%, 99%, seems like we can't get away with that. I am going to agree strongly with what Rob Katz said earlier. The nature of designs and the design process is you wind up with a novel, unique, ornamental, new, original, and non-obvious design. It's just the nature of the beast. There is no prior art to it. They are examined. I think your argument about a registration system, Professor, is, is really should be not that the design patent system is in effect a registration system, but perhaps we need a registration system because of what's going on and something that simply and easily registers designs like the Australian first tier system or like what goes in Europe, on in Europe, I think is a good idea worth considering. Gary, I, I think that's a fair point as a matter of design. Right? We might, in fact, when we come up with designs, naturally get to these different results. And I'd be comfortable if I thought that we were applying that same analysis when we got to infringement. So that if we had somebody who was copying, right, or designs that really were identical, we were finding infringement. But if some of these designs that didn't look all that much like others, uh, we said, oh, well, that's clearly a novel and non-obvious design by the infringer, and therefore no infringement. The more we're willing to broaden the scope of the right on the infringement side, the more nervous I get about the, uh, the conclusion that validity is easy to pass. But, so but you're suggesting an identical test for design I'm, patent infringement. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that, but I'm suggesting that this, what's troubling is the disconnect between the low standard uh, that makes it easy to get the protection, 
right? Uh, and uh, and a broader conception of what the, what the patent is. What's and I'm not so sure the stats, the statistics have bear that all out. With all due respect, I mean, yeah, you you got this seemingly liberal gate in. But on the way out, post-Egyptian goddess, at least, and even pre, I mean, even after Markman 1995, the amount of findings of infringement in lookalike cases is quite low. And remember, we need to divide up the design patent world into the counterfeit situations, and knockoffs, and lookalikes. And the, the, I think the, key, the interesting part of the discussion is the lookalikes, the knockoffs. So, uh, and it's, it's it quite, you know, has been quite rare that you've had findings of infringement. And I think, you know, again, this is because you've got to pretty much land right on the spot. Uh, for there to be finding infringement in these cases. All the cases I've handled involve situations where the accused infringer has copied the patented design either well or not so well or creating some distance. Perhaps the cupcake case they know is one where they created sufficient distance. I'm not saying there should never be a finding of infringement, but most of the cases the, the defendant has really copied what you're doing and come as close as they can without actually being identical. And a lot of those cases are not litigated. A lot of those cases are settled. And the ones you see on these slides are the not so close cases. And with that, I think we are done. <laughs> Thank you very much.